Okay, well, <laughs> I don't think Chris can hear me. Chris, are you there? I'm, I'm on. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm on now. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so, yeah, so you go ahead and lead. Sure. Now, the point of the call is was to I just get uh, go through a demo for days, and that way you can see the the NetSpace uh, platform, and um, you know that that's sort of what the point is to kind of get more familiar with with what this actually does, and, uh, and if you want, we can go into some of the other discussion points. Um, but that's that's basically what we're doing here today. Okay. Well, I, I set up the screen for Mark. So all Mark's got to do is activate it and he's good to go. Okay, just let me bring up, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, the overview PowerPoint is probably uh, the way to go and then I can do some live demos. Just a moment, I'll bring up the, uh, the correct document here and then start sharing the screen. Great. That way you don't have to watch me fumbling around with my... Uh, Are you at home? Yes. I don't hear the dog. Uh, the dog, I, I was away for a couple of days, and the dog is actually uh, away with the uh, the kennels at the moment. We're picking her up this afternoon. We've been missing her very much. <laughs> yes, it'll be, it'll be noisy then. Yes, exactly. If you really need, if you really need a dog, I have two that are sitting right here by my side. I can get them to bark if you really want it. I <laughs> don't feel right. Uh, can, I, I've just started sharing the screen. Uh, does that looks good? You got it. Okay. Yep. Uh, all right. Then look, I'll, I'll, I'll launch into. Dave, hey, before uh, you start before you start, Mark. David, I'm going to record this, so. It, you probably understand all this, but I will record it and I'll send you the link. It'll be on, uh, you know, it'll be on YouTube private. So. Okay. Okay. Good. Let's hope I understand part of it. <laughs> I think I should. You will. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure. And um, Deb, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, this is not, you know, you, you, you polish uh, Hollywood production presentation or anything like that yet, and certainly um, we work with you on on making it more so for the uh, for the real estate application. But this is sort of more, more an overview of, of the foundational stuff that we're doing. Uh, and so, introduction here, uh, just a bit of background. Uh, I, I think I mentioned to you that Next Space is actually a spin-off from Right Hemisphere. It's been well, in fact, it's probably about 12 or 13 years um, now in uh, Visual City uh, type work doing uh, some of these, you know, uh, images go back quite some way. And these are all about, you know, bringing together data and, and visuals and graphics for, for 3D City work and presentations and flyovers and there's all sorts of things. But uh, it all came from an era in which um, it was based on the sort of technology that right here are doing a lot of people were doing which was you know to extract translate load uh, and, and to better bring that uh, data together and display it and so forth which we can still do as part of this platform but um, we're talking more about this extract translate load process versus the netflix process we'll talk more about that as we go through and next space as i say uh spun off from the right hemisphere business about 2007. Uh, so we're now uh, the the big issue is we're you know we don't have a problem with the amount of data out there it's making sense of it and uh, we, we feel a bit certainly a big part of making sense of it is actually got to bring it together into a common context uh, and to to do that real time without um, making lots of copies of it which get out of date pretty quickly and uh, you know one of the big problems we see here is you know a multiplicity of data bases or, or data sources, both visual and non-visual, and lots of stakeholders who need to look at them. And every one of these lines represents a potential IT project to connect them. And uh, so our, our goal is to systematize the connectivity of data between uh, multiple databases and multiple stakeholders. So uh, to end up something that looks more like this. And the way we've achieved that is to put uh, microservices between uh, all the different data sources and to continue to build 
uh, those more deeply and uh, and widely across more data sources. And every time we do that, we're building a, a universal translator to a single API so that uh, any stakeholder can access a multiplicity of databases simultaneously. And uh, that data can be visual and non-visual. And the trick to that is to be storing every time we uh, identify an asset which may be represented across multiple different stores is to store its unique ID and then store the relationship between that ID. So you know, a lamppost yeah. may be represented in, uh, you know, visually in a CAD program and in a, in a small development may be represented with an ESRI database as a two-dimensional cross. It may be represented in an AMFM system, it may be represented in uh, the utilities uh, GIS system. So there, there are potentially multiple representations for one, what is in fact one lamppost in, in the street and there's multiple, you know, to, to store those relationships or it might be that there's simply a layer called um, lighting, you know, within a block and then that, that uh, street lamp becomes a child of the lighting data uh, for that block. So it's understanding those sort of parent, child, ancestor, descendant type relationships between uh, entities. Uh, does that make sense, uh, David? Yeah, we, we were doing a lot of this. Uh, we're a big Informatica customer. Mm -hmm. so Informatica is a software tool that helps you do data integration. So we were, we were doing a lot of this um, at JLL as part of our overall uh, platform and program for data management. Government. Right. The interesting thing, it, you still have to map the unique IDs to make make them relate, right? So somebody yes, yes. on your side is doing that. Yes, and and you know part of this is is getting the tools here that help make those uh, relationships. And yes, a lot of them you have to define, uh, you, you know, manually to start off with. But there are, there are, there's a lot more potential future to do more intelligent mapping. Between those entities, the first the first goal is to build the asset registry, which says, you know, th this is a lamp post, and these are all of the unique IDs across all of the different systems that, in some way, relate to this lamp post, and storing that, and then storing the information about how they relate to each other and how they link. But yes, you know, uh, establishing those relationships uh, is also, you know, an important part, and you know, initially can be time consuming, but you can pick up those relationships and do it a bite at a time as you, uh, you know, as people actually form the information, ah, oh, this is that, and then make assumptions about the rest of the data sets. Yeah. The other thing we were doing that was uh, really interesting was um, this take, you know, what you just described takes a lot of time. And so what we were, what we did was we sort of created this big data lake and we'd, we'd take a source, not really know what we were going to do with it yet, and dump it in the data lake. And then sort of come back to it later, but you still had access to data there, and people could look at it and play with it. And then the once they did that a few times, the relationships became more transparent, and then yes. the mapping the mapping got easier. So I don't, I don't know if you're doing that, but it, yeah. oh yes, okay. yes, okay, yeah, right. absolutely, Good. yeah. So, so we we try not to um to to do the you know extract translate load process too much in our credit data lakes, but we certainly do do it while we're, we're looking at data. You know, we, we'll, uh, you know, create a big pool, you know, or, you know, a big cache, if you like, of, of the data. Right. Um, and, and we need to do that also, you know, when some of the data sources, you know, are not performant enough, you know, to deal with, you know, multiplicity of real-time access, and we have to build cache uh, type strategies, you know, for that as well. But uh, yeah, generally, if we can visualize as much as possible and then make those relationships on the fly uh, and then make inferences from them. That's great. So, That's good stuff. So, so one of the arguments that we put forward is, you know, uh, this, you know, shell 3D models. I mean, the number of different presentations and, and uh, uh, you know, visualizations that we see. Uh, across the board, um, you know, wonderful, you know, vir virtual reality, augmented reality, Hollywood type rendering productions, and, and so forth. Are, um, so they're, you, you know, often lost, you know, within months of them. Yeah, sorry, we just got 
So we'll move in the other room. So <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, those presentations. Is that your work? Yes, yes, just on another call. <laughs> she just got uh, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love when it happens. I absolutely yeah. love when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so, so the um, sorry about that. The so the the, the models themselves, you know, are terrific. But you know, so much of it is is related to the data. You know, so as you you know wander through a visualization or presentation, you're popping up data, and if that data is uh, not you know live connected to the source, uh, then of course those those models and those presentations tend to get out of date really really quickly. Um, so again, that was one of the the big challenges that we're taking on is to try and connect the data as much as possible real time to the different data sources, you know, where, wherever they were. Uh, and and that was uh, as I say that was a a process that was developed in the aerospace industry where we were trying to bring real time data to the manufacturing um, shop floor. For building 787s, in fact, and um, Gulfstream jets and things like that, and they, they wanted to make sure that the data from a multiplicity of different uh, ERP manufacturing uh, and CAD systems were coming together, and as they changed, to be able to see that on the graphics or on the uh, on the factory floor, uh, and you know, a, a universal problem. So. Um, right. Yeah, we, so we this is where I, I mentioned we we're doing a bunch of this stuff. At JLO, and then the the take up was slow, and the costs were high. Yeah, and a lot of it had to do with that last slide. Um, we, we just couldn't replicate fast enough and keep them alive without spending um, an inordinate amount of money on each one, and then then it started to peter out. Yes, yeah, it, it's it's a challenge, and so you know a lot of the work that's gone under the hood is to build. Uh, tools that you know for for the creation of these microservices, the management of those microservices, you know, scaling them, customizing them, and uh, you know, then the you know, a universe. It, it, it's about building the system in the end, and then being able to modify that system while the while the vehicle's moving. <laughs> in some sense, so yeah, it, it is a challenge certainly. So so that's our, our uh, you know premises, you know. Uh, rather than your extract transit, they're more of a Netflix model, review, improve, sustain. But leave data in in the, in the sources where you know, they're, they're most. Uh, there's already systems in place for the gathering, um, the curation, you know, the management, the sorting of the information. There's no reason necessarily to change data sources unless they happen to be spreadsheets or you know horribly inefficient ways of storing and managing data. In which case, we can take that job on for them and move that data over and offer people a uh, a hosted Amazon data service, and we'll talk more about that. And I think initially for for the real estate uh, application, uh, that that's how we would be doing it: is is first building the model, uh, and, and so we actually do have a data model uh, for that, and then connecting wherever feasible um, those those feeds to external sources through the microservices. Uh, so what does this look like? Well, this is a an example application will actually do this. You, know, you navigate from the world view down to the local and down to utilities and through the 3D cities textured and so forth, or untextured as as desired. Um, but it uh, and so uh, you know one of the, this is a slide actually borrowed from a, a consenting uh, system that we're working on locally here, where you, know, you bring in all of your BIM data, which contains uh, you know quite a rich amount of information. Not, not as rich, in fact, as the councils would like, but certainly data worth having, and, um, and then, then get an understanding of that and be able to control the uh, actually the format and, and the, the quality of data coming through consenting in the form of 3D models. Because at the moment, I, I don't know what it's like over there, but uh, that most of the places, you know, requiring stacks of uh, paper drawings, you know, when in fact the uh, that the source of that information are you know 3D BIM models using you know Revit and ArchiCAD and things like that, uh, and so you know we're helping them extract the, the, the most out of that with a a, a, a 3D uh, sort of asset management and document management process. Mm. Uh, you know, bringing it through to reuse that data into um, you know metadata standards, GIS, smart cities, data optimization, and so forth, and you know, being able to share that through a common um, data portal. Um, so uh, these are so, some of the so, data sources. Can I just oh. uh, BIM? Yep. BIM to me is 
building information management. Is that what you're talking about, or is it what's the acronym there? Oh, well, yeah, that's a good question. Yes, uh, building information management. Um, uh, a lot of people also call it building information modeling. Um, okay. I, I, I definitely prefer the management because uh, I, I think there's an implication that you, you build a 3D model in a CAD system and put some metadata on it, and you've solved your BIM problem, which you know uh, is a long way from the truth, I think. Right. And so, you know, we talk much more about um, the, the, the whole workflow from CAD and the slide and someone talks about it, which is, you know, the, the data that's within a BIM model forms part of the total information that may be required for the, uh, you, you know, manufacture construction, um, you know, facilities, process management, right. uh, you know, the long-term life cycle of the building. Uh, there's only going to be, you know, a fraction of that as part of the original CAD data. And so that data uh, needs to be a living, breathing set of information that's potentially connected not to, you know, simply one moving, you know, extract translated file in the form of an ISC, but in fact a whole lot of databases that link, you know, to uh, all, all sorts of data sets of relevance, which could be, you know, within the organisation or external to it, and they need to be modified and updated, linked to the graphics, you know, the visuals of, of that model and change as needed for different jobs and presented, you know, also, you know, in a very specific way. Uh, part of the goal, uh, David, is to be able to build a user interface uh, almost, for, you know, on an individual basis. So every single user would have their own user interface tailored just to them so that they can learn their task, their, their particular, uh, you know, job process um, very, very quickly without having to learn a, a giant system and to make it affordable to build a huge number of different user interfaces to the same data matrix, uh, that that means you, you, know, you simply cherry pick the information you need to do a specific job or a workflow, which might be counting and logging street lamps, or it might be you know, counting shrubs in the garden, whatever it is. You, know, you, can build, you can afford to build a, a user interface just for that. So training times uh, and cost of employees, uh, it is greatly reduced, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm just curious about the, I know what systems that comes from, but what's the general pool of uh, providers of those sources for you? Like, How do you go about getting access to Autodesk for a certain amount of buildings, or how does that work? Oh, I see. Yeah, so the uh, at, with with things like Autodesk, they, there's a number of different products. So probably the main one being uh, Revit. So we'll take that as an example. So in the case of um, Revit, we can take uh, the old-fashioned extract, translate, load process, where uh, we take uh, the IFC uh, file, which is exported from Revit, which is a BIM model, and then we deconstruct that IFC file into a database structure which stores uh, the hierarchy information, all of the metadata information in an actual database now, and the visuals as multiple different um, levels of detail, which are uh, associated with levels of design, potentially depending on how they've been constructed in the BIM model. And so the whole thing is, is deconstructed and made available uh, through a database interface. So you can uh, touch an object in a visual representation in another viewer and the data associated instead of referencing a static file references a database which can also be touched from multiple other places. So we, we have tools, we're, we're very familiar obviously with the right hemisphere background on doing the both the visual and data translation of a very wide range of um, CAD uh, systems and formats. In fact that's one of the um, the aspects of this business, which is not part of this presentation, but I can show you, which is for reading, you know, plant and process data, Aviva and um, uh, Smart Plant 3D, and all of the plant and process type CAD format. So we, we have a, a we, we're reasonably um, familiar with it, with a whole bunch of the tools around the extract, uh, translate, load. There are also ways of doing. Uh, linking to CAD systems, which uh, provide more of the Netflix type, you know, the real time. But there's always a, a cut off point where you have to submit uh, a, a model, which is at some point in a uh, design process, you know, it's, a, it's an approved revisional version. 
uh, and then that can be uh, you know dropped in a hot box or connected to a server, which is what we're you know uh, doing at the right hemisphere side, and we have those tools uh, available to us where you can simply drop it, and that that update and that translation will automatically happen. It gets quite complicated from there, um, matching uh, unique IDs that are uh, versions or revisions. You know, is this object the same object, or, or is it something new? And, and, and establishing those rules uh, within a different, you know, a given project based on the, the naming conventions can actually be, you know, potentially quite a complex uh, setup. So depending on how uh, how real time, uh, how granular. The link with you know BIM needs to be that there are solutions. I suspect within this real estate context that uh, the, the the relationships will be you know fairly simple uh, with exterior shells uh, and, and you know perhaps um, space zones uh, being of, of the most interest if we were to link in uh, BIM information. Does, does that help, Dave? I'm sorry that was probably a bit wordy. Well, no, I mean. It, it, it does. I, I was more, the question I think I had was a little bit more of the, who gives you the files? Like, where do you go get them? Oh, <laughs> uh, typically the, 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 the files themselves will come from the, you know, the architects, uh, the engineering consultants, um, and depending yeah. on the, uh, you know, we found, uh, I, I, I don't know about JLL, but I see, you know, CBRE have a, a program of essentially demanding, you know, the full BIM models as part of their uh, development, certainly down this end of the world. And so I think there's a much more uh, you know, intelligent approach to gathering the design data uh, now from the you know, uh, contracted consultants uh, than there used to be. So, so, um, yeah, because I know what our process was to grab that data. And it was, um, it was you know, just getting, it was, it was very personal, right? So you, you, you had to go get data from specific people to to fulfill a need when you were doing one of these buildings so it was, yeah. it was good when you had that data and when you could find the person to go get the file and when you didn't it became more difficult so it must be a bit of a process for you guys to get as many files as you can so to speak yes yeah and, and it depends very much on on the task at hand i mean I, i'm presenting here you know a very general overview which you know, it is an amalgamation of many different projects and workflows. And I think a lot of it comes down to designing, you know, the workflow for a given solution. And, you know, as part of understanding that, you've also got to understand the uh, the relationships between all the different um, data suppliers, you know, and figure out, well, where can we systematize that, that data supply process? And where is it, you know, based on, you know, wandering down with your, you know, your thumb drive to the, you know, to the to the place and picking up a file. Um, but I think my, this this is Kevin. Yes. You know, my feet. I was just at Esri. I, I I had a meeting with uh, with JLL, with CBRE, um, with Knight. Knight. Forget the other. I always forget that company. Knight some Airmark or whatever. Knight, Knight Frank. Yeah. Knight Frank, right? Um, and uh, also with. Um, with uh, uh, let me see, Seabury and I, Frank Cushman and Wakefield, and mm -hmm. every one of those companies said the same thing to me when I talked about data. They said one, the data comes from the offices, usually like you know the regional or the local offices, and they collect it in every which way. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a cohesive data acquisition, although they subscribe to data. They get a lot of data from the cities. But they don't share with anybody, and and every one of those uh, customers, we're at varying degrees of activity. Some of them are paying us, some of them are having us make samples, some of us are just having conversations with us. Um, but they don't, they they just give me, um, you know, they just give me lat long uh, pins and say, can you build all these buildings for us? And then when you get them, they're going to go into a black hole. And mm -hmm. we're going to take them, we're going to do a bunch of stuff with them, and we're going to supply our offices, and we're going to do our thing. So most of them are highly secretive. Now, the new companies, and I'm sure that, that David can share a lot of his own experience, the new companies that are getting into 3D and getting into sharing this type of software, they are much more open 
uh, minded and are saying, well, what are my options? You know, and and how do I do this? And and how? And that's when I kind of say, well, we we think we have a solution for you. You know, you don't really need to use Esri. We think there's a better solution or something that's more flexible and more you know easier to integrate and easier to bring data into. So mm -hmm. it's it's very um, very much a separate. Uh, I want to call it separate you know, cones, everybody's got their own funnel. And even within the companies, and that's something that David had shared. So that whole experience at Esri was just that. And and even at the at the real estate meeting, when uh, the person who runs Esri Real Estate said, well, we're gonna have these meetups and share ideas, no brokers are allowed because we'll just have a bunch of fist fights. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. It, yes, it, 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 like, you know, I mean, it, it's certainly true that we, we, you know, we've got a bit to learn yet about, you know, how uh, the, the real estate industry could take advantage of, of this new generation of BIM models and so forth, uh, and, and to what extent, you know, there might be control over uh, the, the, the processes and the data exchanges, for, you know, from the various stakeholders, and it's something we need to Look at at the moment, you know, the, there are you know simply some ideas about how we can use the the shells of buildings or the spaces within it, which might relate. But I, I think there needs to be a lot more discussion about you know the best way to integrate you know BIM and talk about it rather than just a you know yes we do BIM you know it's uh, it's you know, what's it for how do, how does it work into the specific you know, information workflow and how can we control the, the inputs and outputs. Uh, and we don't know the answers to that yet. We, we, we know we have the tools to, to get the data in and out, you know, that that is not the problem. That the, the problem is more understanding that, you know, the right solution and the right way to use that data or the right way to even influence, you know, the, the, the source data before it's made. Well, and uh, it'll go beyond them. So if you think about typical class A CBD office building with a leasing plan and a stacking plan and all of that. That's ultimately, if you want to show that when you fly through the city and you want to show what's available, what space is available in the, in the market, you need to get down to almost the space, certainly the floor and the space level. Oh, that, yeah. That's going yeah. to come beyond BIM, right? But, it, but it's there. And this is yeah. where you're talking about all the companies have sort of a different approach most of it is yes. and it's at the office level and all of that but, but you can mock that yeah. up easily and it looks awesome when you do that yeah well well, well i think you know uh, from the opposite the way that we deal in with that is the the visuals you know that you know we put into the chosen viewer and i have to talk you know specific so because we could use multiple different viewers, of course, with this data infrastructure. But the way that uh, we're relating things together, remember I talked about relating uh, the, you know, different uh, data instances about, you know, a, a building or a space or a, a, a street lamp and so forth. And, and one of the really important things about a manager is, is the visual levels of detail in, in visual file versions so that when we're zooming through a city we don't want to be displaying you know BIM CAD models you know from a geometry perspective they're, they're too heavy they're too uh, complex and, and so you know we tend we, we use within a CZM for the moment and wherever possible a new file format called GLB which um, and, and there are strategic reasons for that we don't have to use only that but that's a it's a good one to use, but we don't have a level of detail of a building which is just the shell, and then we'll have a level of detail of that building which is the, the each individual floor, and then we'll have a level of detail which contains the rooms within that floor. And the question is, at which point do you exit the geospatial view and into a more detailed BIM view? And I'll, I'll show you an example of this as we go through. And the trick is to be managing the relationship between all those different representations of the same thing that you know this shit you know single piece of geometry representing the shell of the building is actually related as a parent and, and an equivalent to the top level of detail of a fully detailed and granular um, BIM model which is accurate down to the you know light socket level with information but you don't want to be showing you know so it's about 
and when I jump into virtual reality or augmented reality, I'm going to want some version of visual, you know, fidelity that's in between that. But I don't want to lose my my data relationships when I jump from one visual metaphor to another. Correct. Well, and and there's different. You can solve different problems. So you can solve a leasing problem. You can solve a facilities management problem with different pieces of that. Exactly. You don't want to lose, you don't want to lose track of that. Precisely, and that, that, that's the, the, the basis of what we're doing at a day level is so important, is to maintain that, that relationship between the, the multiplicity now of visual. You've got point clouds, you've got photographs, you've got BIM models, you've got um, augmented reality models, virtual reality models, different levels of detail from a few polygons to you know highly dense things, and they're all some form of representation of reality along with all of the, you know, the, the data entries for those things in, in different databases and keeping track of that mesh is, is, the, is the key goal. And once we've got, you know, control that mesh, you know, establishing relationships, building on them, using them for, for display and understanding. So we, we've had to dive quite deep and then surface into verticals of which, you know, this real estate is obviously a very exciting vertical. Yeah. So, uh, here's, uh, you know, uh, something a bit more specific, you know, we've talked about um, gather unified link. Um, so we have building, floor, room bed, as we talked about. And then the question is, well, you know, to what extent can we automatically gather that from a BIM model? But if we don't have it from a BIM model, you know, we'll create a tool which will go and we can split. We've, we've already done some of this work where we can split buildings into floors, but there's still a a bit of manual labour, but we think, well, we'll charge that. If you have a building the size of the Eon Tower, um, then there'll be a, you know, a fee for uh, splitting that and making it, you know, breaking it up into the, the stack of buildings, and there'll be another fee per floor to break it into the floor spaces based on the, you know, the rooms. Um, and then, you know, to, to gather this data, and, and this, you know, don't we hope we get a lot more information from you on, you know, what, what does this, um, data audit and sourcing need to look like, uh, and, and then amalgamate, link and store it through the Bruce system. There's geometry authoring, as we talked about, additional building splitters, automated semi-automatic workflows uh, that's stored on the cloud, and then it's available through custom uh, applications, which will look at that data model over here on the left through the lens of any specific user interface for. Um, you know, the visualisation, building performance, general building floor plan, utilities, data rates, availability as required. Uh, does that make sense there? It does, yeah. It, um, yeah yes, there's not much I can add to that. There, there's, a, there's a ton of, back to problem solving, right? There's a, there's a ton of things you can use this for to problem solve. And you have to define, there, there'll be common elements to multiple problems, and then there'll be specific elements to specific problems, right? So and you, we've got to be able to sort of manage the two flows of information into those two buckets. Yes. Yeah, and, and our goal is wherever it's possible to be, you know, sharing data between applications and solutions, you know, while still having the flexibility to be custom at the user experience end. Right. Well, then, then there, I mean, you can white, you can white label. It's, in, you know, I saw a, something somebody sent me last week had the picture of the Aon Center, which just kind of blew me away because we we did a lot of work. We, we obviously JLL, that's the U.S. stock stock exchange headquarters for JLL is is in the Aon Center. So we a lot of our work that we did in this space, we use the Aon Center. I thought you stole from us actually. <laughs> I, I, it, it, I'm, I'm kind of flattered to, to, to hear that, but I can assure you, <laughs> you nothing. nothing it's also else. called the Standard Oil Building, by the way. I didn't see that in your list. I never heard it called the Wilshire Tower, but that's where I got it from. Some database, actually. But, uh, I never heard about that, but it was the Standard Oil Building first. Okay. It was built for Standard Oil Company, and then then it became the Amoco Building. This uh -huh. all brought Standard Oil. And now it's the Aon Center. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, uh, um, this, this is Kevin. Um, I, I mean, I've got a question just from a philosophical standpoint, and, and we're really talking about the real estate 
industry. Um, yeah. Do you envision the, you know, part of the activities of this JV to be sort of data hunting? In other words, my experiences with these buildings, it's really great. They're really great to look at. They're great context. And we, we, you know, we do a decent business there. We're seeing a bigger, more growth. But when you start adding data to it, all of a sudden it sort of becomes, you know, valuable by factors of, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight. So yeah. if we end up saying, look, let's take Chicago and let's really, let's just, you know, let's use the city data. Let's use some other thing. Let's just get all that data in there now. And you know, have smart buildings, which is what we call smart buildings, is is good-looking buildings with data. And let's yeah. let's let's stack them. Let's let's you know carve them up and get the floors right. Um, and give different data premium packages to users. So you can you know, you may only want to look at this data for your use, but you're going to get all this other data just as as a basic service. But as a premium service, we're going to give you some other really good data. And so I wonder if we should become part of the experts of getting data, given the fact Boy. that these companies all work in their own funnels. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Based on what David said the other day, you know, about, about that, so I, I, I would think absolutely, um, you know, that would yeah. seem like a, a core value proposition here is to build a data model, you know, extend it as necessary and fill it out ourselves. And if we can you know, provide services to link, you know, a particular customer's data into it, great, you know, and overlay it. Um, but in general, I, I think, yeah, we should be looking to scrape and hunt for data as much as possible. Uh, Dave, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, you, without, a, uh, without a doubt, the, um, the new co has to have a pretty serious element of data science to it. So you, yeah. ref, you reference smart buildings, but smart buildings need to exist within smart markets um, and sub markets and because uh, it's all the things that real estate people are interested in that's not the think about the building it's not just the building the building's important but in all honesty you know there are 30 dvd class a buildings you know that all offer similar amenities things like that it's where they are what the amenities are what's the labor analytics around it um, the travel times, the, all these things that the only data can augment. And so it, we need, the new co needs to be in the data science business as it relates to location analysis and building information management and you know, a bunch of other things that will actually, if you put that all together, I mean, that's, that's just so powerful for the users, the people who need space, and, and want to go get space. And that's where you start to really affect the leasing problem in, in the world. And there's a lot of, uh, that's where the money's made, right? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I mean, we should have our own KPIs, right? Our own key performance indicators. And, you know, to me, that's not something CyberCity does, right? We make buildings. We're really good at buildings, and then the, the users put information in them and do things. But, when you when you control the software and you're controlling the the, the communication, um, it just seems like it's such a differentiator to basically say you know we can score the building, we can score the floors, we can score you know everything, and we've got ways of doing it. And it just seems like there's so much data being accumulated everywhere, all over the place. I mean, I, I look at some of the customers that we're building for now. Um, they all protect their data. They all want to, they all see their data as their most important asset, it seems like. And that maybe we, we can show up and say, yeah, you know, we, you really need us because you don't have this, but we've got data too. And, and so now we bring a certain value add to the table that Esri does not bring, right? Esri doesn't bring that. Esri just brings the software. We tell you to go to a government site or a data portal to get your data. They don't want to be in the data business. Jack doesn't. And, uh, you know, Autodesk doesn't necessarily, right? They give you the tools to make your data. All these players, um, it just seems like, you know, it, it, I just, the more I think about it, the more I think that when you look at our, the personnel, it's these data scientists that data, whatever you want to call them, uh, data managers, scientists, 
data organizers that are going to be somewhat innovators in looking at these different profiles. So, so there, there, there are four things. But when I listen to this conversation, and what I know about what we need to do here, there are four things that need to happen as part of NUCO. And, and those four things are gathering, culling, because there's going to be an awful lot of data and what data makes sense from what purpose and what, what's good, what's not good. These are, culling is going to be an important factor, interpreting for the sake of clients and then presenting, right? So, so the software takes care of a couple of these things, but you need to have you, at least really at least three people, two of which are focused on uh, one of which is focused on, you know, managing and, and uh, managing that data and being the data focal point, and the other is how you present it and how you how the technology works to make process better on the back end for it. So those are two plots, if you will, that need to exist in the new co in terms of people that focus on that stuff. And, and, you, and you don't need a lot because you can use you can use the various the entities that are part of the JV to, to do a lot of that, but somebody's somebody has to own those processes and it has to come together as a team. Yeah, completely agree. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I'll keep going through some of the tools. This is you know um, more visual background. You know, so as we pop up, I mean, the data model you know designed here for a building. You know, a floor. These are all entirely flexible structures, and I can even show you some of the tools to build them. So they can be more or less. And part of our job here is, as you know, was just stated, uh, to design. You know, what is the right data to display within you know what particular context? How many different user experiences are we going to aim for with a minimum viable product, and what is going to be in, you know, in the in that data experience? Um, we have the tools there to build those and make them look, you know. Is required. Um, and we'll go into into that. That's all. So this this is just a uh, a slideshow in in case the you know something happens to my server in the background. But <clears throat> when I do this live, um, so zoom into uh, cities and all of the utilities. Point and click. You can build you you know a concept of entities uh, and associate data models yeah. with them. That, that link, the, you know, everything from photographs to point cloud scans to what have you, and data, you know, about objects. Yeah. Um, we can drag and drop documents associated with particular buildings. Why, you can see we've got a BIM model um, that's been simply dragged and dropped into the geospatial context, and documents related to that building dragged and dropped next to it. We can then pop up a, a specific BIM view. This is, in fact, the old right hemisphere drilled down, you know, to. Well, first is the first. No, it's not. So have we got someone else on the phone? Or? No, I think Kevin was addressing someone in the background. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so yeah, we can drill into the you know into the build model as it relates to the geospatial model, uh, right down to the you know details of the um, HVAC or light switches or what have you. Um, we can start doing searches and filters. You know, this is one, for example, show, you know, show me all of the earthquake-prone buildings um, with the, the fallout zone intersects with a strategic route within the city, as an example. Right. Uh, and um, yeah, when we were doing this, we actually had real-time links to IoT sensors in the AI yeah. building, so we could show traffic in the lobby uh, and other places. It was interesting. It, it sort of gave this whole reality thing uh, to the demos that we were doing. Yeah, yeah, it, it's we, we've got it, the the structure set up to uh, to read sensor data uh, in real time and IoT type information, but we haven't got any good examples on our standard demos yet. Yeah. Um, and I thought I'd just pop up this uh, slide. This is you know just some work we're doing with um, uh, local Maori in New Zealand is you know a. Uh, in the historical record of, of, of you know, New Zealand being able to uh, create a tool that uh, interacts with, with everyone, with the public, you know, so people can start bringing their own stories together with, uh, uh, you know, stories from, you know, historical records, you know, equivalent to the Smithsonian and so forth. Uh, you know, so, you know, you get a, you get a picture, a, a digital twin, if you like, of the land. Uh, which yeah. local Maori native tribes and everything very interested in. But uh, so that's the 
it's the simple one. I'll, I'll jump in here and show you a few specific uh, examples. Um, I'll just I'll go into this one first. This is I'll turn these layers off. So. Um, so we we have this as you know a, a zoom out you know on the whole country it it's got uh, elevation data and we've built tool, tools that will uh, tile in uh, the you know aerial photography and uh, DTMs uh, ourselves so we can take control of the the season tiles and the data and build you know ones based on high resolution and it's available through the the standard terrains within uh, you know SDK so we can we can get a much high detail um, definition of you know down to one meter terrain grid and the goal being is that uh, as uh, as we make you know, more and more tools available that people should be able to send up their drone and pick up, you know, a localised LIDAR or aerial photography and it should be possible, you know, very quickly and easily to integrate that data into uh, the existing information uh, of the um, the standard model. So we've built a, a model which goes beyond the cesium standard model. Um, I'll just go back to 2D and we'll go back and I'll select go back into the centre of the city here for a moment. Uh, this is the cathedral. This is, uh, we'll show this city. This is uh, Christchurch, uh, which was hit by a serious earthquake. So it's an area we did uh, quite a lot of work in. And uh, we can bring in some examples here. Uh, so uh, as we, so the, these are all different data layers that the, the RAM Roads, for example, this comes from a, a live uh, data set of the New Zealand uh, road asset management information. It gives us detailed information about the road, you know, and then we have you know, photos and so forth. If we had pictures of the road at that point, uh, primary parcel information back to the local land information. And these are not through um, ESRI, these are actually live links back to the data as it changes, back with the council's uh, supply water. Wastewater. These are live feeds to the, the council systems. Uh, with all the information about you know depth, type of pipe and uh, infrastructure. And I'm sure you've seen all this type of thing, Dave. But uh, the point is, it's it's live, and we can have. Uh, uh, actually, lots of it, I'm actually not seeing what you're showing. I don't think. Is that what we're stuck on right now? Is the PowerPoint? At least my. Oh. My screen. I don't know if anybody else is. Oh wow! Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's, so it's not showing the demo. Uh, Mark in the screen. Oh, hang on. Uh, I, I I wonder why that is. You got to turn off all um, the other screens. You have multiple monitors going. Yeah. Uh, screen of monitor one. Screen of monitor two. It's a PowerPoint must have done something. There you, Can you go. See? Wow. Yeah. I, <laughs> okay, I better I better start that again. <laughs> um, I understood what you said. I just didn't, I just didn't see it. Uh, okay, that's right. I have to know what went on. Is that it was all it was the same screen that PowerPoint was on a moment ago, and I just uh, changed the. Anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, we'll. Uh, uh, so what I was saying before is it 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 gets down to a. A level of um, detail by you know we don't have to rely on the the standard you know cesium or available data we can actually we know how to tile in our own data sources uh, from lidar and aerial photography to give you know far more accurate uh, um, information you know so it gets down we can you know we'll see the roads properly. Uh, Set up, whereas with you know the, that those roads would just be on the side of sloped hills normally, um, you know, little tracks, um, and so you know, we can tile out, and as I say, we can integrate data from uh, you, you know our own aerial uh, shoots, or a customer can use their own aerial data or lidar data to get a much more accurate uh, localized image of you know what's going on. Um, but I'll just look back. We'll go back into uh, the, the 
central Christchurch. I've got a few more buildings set up as part of this. And we'll turn on So as, as we get in here, the, these data feeds are linked uh, off to, live to the council at the moment. So we see you know, information about pipes, utilities, um, you know, roads, land parcels. And it accommodates for overlapping information as well. Um, so you know, it'll, it'll say there are multiple sources of information for um, the area of this parcel, you know, one, two, three, which one would you like to use as a priority? Um, this is a you know, BIM model of a library. This is the standard data model that's been set up. Uh, we can change that. Uh, so we, you know, we have, uh, we have you know, building footprint. So this is a complete database of, of metadata from the BIM models, uh, you know, right down to the acoustic barriers within the building and so forth, if necessary. Up photographs, so you, you simply you know put in whatever uh, you like. Documents, you can just literally drag and drop from your file system in here, and it stores documents about this building, and you can uh, organise them and structure them. This links into the live uh, HP document management system called Trim, which is used by councils extensively in this country. So I'm actually drilling into uh, actual uh, data here that's stored within the council database real time live. Uh, it's probably private, so I'll shut that down. Uh, is a commenting system, so we can hold a conversation about the library or any, you know, sort of the, the library or the floor or the room in the library, and, and, and whatever level of granularity we can start a conversation. Uh, resource consent information, uh, the 3D model, oh, BIM model of this building, so when I click on it, 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 it automatically um, downloads the fully detailed. So it's at this point you'll see in here that we've jumped out of the uh, uh, you know, geospatial view at the building level. And our next step is to go in the geospatial level down to the floor and then the room space level. But uh, at the moment when we want to go down to those next levels, we pop up this view and it's a, a level of detail model associated uh, with that. You know, Mark, this this is Kevin. Um, one of the ideas yeah. um, after talking to people about you know merging data, I mean, this is kind of what I was thinking is if you get to a situation where, say, you look at the Cushman and Wakefield office in El Segundo, and there's yeah. a person working at the front desk who does a lot of coordination work, and there's a bunch of brokers working, I can envision the broker they're using our software, you know, giving her a list of of files right or sending her an email with files yeah. say hey i need you to put all this into these floors for me before so i can keep track of all my leads and all my activities and i want you to go ahead and keep it up to date for me so i have all that current to me that's a huge benefit because you have to be able to allow for you know maybe like mid-level administrators to be able to drag and drop data and to bring data into the system and um, yes. not not I mean this BIM stuff is not obviously what they're they're more into the lease rates and yeah. know, the, the the score of the building and the what fits for their client and all that, but just creating that that window where you can drag and drop to me is like it's really to me it's like a killer app for this industry because it allows you to sort of scale it even at the office level where you're not relying on the consultants to do it. Or the IT person in Arizona to do it, you can do it yourself, right? The yes. You can do it. I mean, yeah. you would kind of agree with that, uh, David? Um, uh, yes. Um, so, so when we were doing our stuff, we had we had a model that was a give it to the model that was completed, that they could just use, and that any, you know pretty much anybody could manipulate. And then we had a then we had a more sophisticated model that was for the consulting side of our business. So the what I'd call the add to model. And yeah. And once once you it was amazing how you could draw people in with a, we're gonna we're just gonna leave this here and give it to you. And then then the consulting really started to fly from that because they wanted more. And of course they needed us to do more for them. And so I think there's a there's room for both. If yeah. I understood your question correctly. 
Yeah, yeah, and and you, these offices are also different. You, you know, you do have you do have both types. You have all different types, and you know, it's just it's different cultures, and different ways of doing things. Um, the, the magic is in making the software handle that, right? I mean, there there isn't really a true product out there that really does that right now. So here's the thing: Is this what you were talking about? Again, it's like where where I have these 3D models, you know, that I, I can drag and drop. Um, I, I will, will, will drop a new a new building in here, and so the user can actually upload uh, a new building. I'll see if this is currently uh, working here. So I go OK, and. Uh, yeah, so for, for, for us, for instance, when we went to a client and we gave them this capability, um, they had to have, they had to have somebody who was, you know, pretty adept at the technology to actually go do it. We found that you know, maybe the hit rate was 40 or 50% of the clients had somebody that could do it. Um, and, and so we, we let them do it, but then went, but then you know, immediately they got over their head the stuff that they really wanted to do. And that's when my team would actually bill uh, clients direct for technology consulting and usage. And we'd, we'd, we'd build the models along with them and then educate them on the process. But, but we'd, we'd actually do the model building. Huh. So, Dave, do you see that I just dropped a new building into the scene? I do, yeah. Yeah, and, and so we go save. And then once we've done that, it will really establish it as, as a, um, a a data entity. Yep. Uh, at, to which point I can you know to drag and drop a photo, you know into here. I can fill it out. I can put it on a, a layer, yep. you know called um, a test or something like that. And you know um, go down. I think that'll. Uh, oh, I haven't got the, the right turned on on this one. I don't think. <laughs> Just as an aside, just as an aside, I mean, I, I just am a huge fan of layering technology because everybody's problem is different, and everybody likes to look at their different problem in their own different way. And then yeah. when you provide enough layers, you can give a very customized view of what they want to see for their purpose without really changing anything. They just have to yeah. flip it. Yeah. And I'll put a I'll put a photo in in here. This is, this is how you sort of add documents and things to the, you know, and this is a, a particular use case and workflow that, um, you know, so, so that's now the, um, the the default photo for that building. If I want to drag and drop a document or something like drag and drop it, if I want to run a, you know, an automated analysis on the IC file, you know, and, and so on. And, and you start comments, you know, this is it. So, uh, and, and it's a very generic thing that we've done here. You know, the, the, the 3D model. If I, you know, if I've got a full BIM model, I drag and drop it in here. I've got videos. If I've, you know, and, and so on. If I want to substitute it, uh, I can replace it with multiple different LODs and keep adding, you know, additional visual models, point cloud scans, and so forth. And you know, in here we'll simply break it down into you know floors, and then a hierarchy of rooms is the addition. That we see necessary for for real estate, um, so so that's how we establish a you know model, and it's like and its relationship geospatially is that you'll notice that that this address was automatically calculated through you know geocode lookup, um, so you know wherever we can make assumptions you know about the data in this building uh, through you know scrape sources, we can automatically fill in information like height, for example, should have automatically been filled in because we do in fact know it from the model. You know, as a calculated thing, this particular version of the software didn't do that. But um, so uh, there's that sort of thing, and you know, we, we talked before we can break down. I, I've just got an example here of you know where we, we've uh, broken down a building into uh, you know we we'll turn off the shell, so that's the shell level of detail broken down. Now we can go by you know floor, um, let's see, floor 82. I think it's floor 79. I put some data on. Yeah, a floor 81. You know, is, is the floor that we've got, um, and that you know brings up you know whatever whatever information you know about that uh, model. And uh, th then we've you know we've got other 
You know, Mark, when you were showing yeah. the floor data, um, here's an idea. If you go back to that floor visual you showed earlier, like floor yeah. 83 or whatever it was, 85, whatever. Which, yeah. um, maybe I'm asking for a lot here, but if you could, um, let, you know, you see the floor plan, uh, where whatever, floor 83 or whatever it was, that had, this one, it's 79. You see the yeah. floor plan, it would be great to be able to click the floor plan, expand it, and then click information within that floor plan. It would be, yeah, it would be amazing. It, Absolutely, that that is actually it's not a big ask at all. I mean, this is part of you know this first process that we need to go through, which is you know this is the you know the, this is the minimum viable app. This is what would be desired. Um, this is the data sources, but that that sort of thing. I've been able to bring that up, you know, uh, in context of the building or separately, but having this as a live interactive, absolutely, all those things are you know. Uh, quite feasible. We, we, yeah, and we, load your we, load your own floor design into. So you've yes, got, you've got the existing floor, and then you've got a new design proposal that you can load in. So absolutely, it, it, it we've, becomes we've, it becomes an interactive uh, receptacle for the acquisition of the lease. It, yes, I mean we've actually built you know little um, CAD systems and so forth. Uh, for their various purposes, so the ability to go in here and then draw your spaces, yes. you know, in, in here, and then they automatically get extruded to the height of this floor, uh, and so you you were actually defining new elements and sub elements of the building. So I've defined a floor already, so you know that's the first. So as part, you know, a version of this user interface is also the authoring tool for someone to go through and split this building. And, so when when we were doing this, we actually went two places from here. We yeah. actually took the floor plan and then did what you just suggested was go into a drawing and authoring tool, very rudimentary, high level one, but you could change walls and spaces and, and say this yes. is what this is what your space could look like. We also we also did two uh, 3D walkthroughs of the floor. Yeah. One, one of which was vacant space, so you could see what the floor looks like before you move in. Completely vacant, yeah. an idea of it. The other is we we did a okay, and now here is the floor the way you would design it. You theoretically could design it with furniture in place and all of that, so you can actually walk through and visualize the space with your people in it. And we we ran both three D walkthroughs off this part of the demo. Yes. And did it? It was it was really powerful. Wow, that's yeah. that is great stuff. I mean, and and that's exactly the sort of that's you know. The, the intent here is by by keeping a relationship. So every time we do this, we're actually storing the. Every time I draw, you know, a box in here to represent a room, I'm relating it. I'm storing that link that this room is related to this floor, which is related to this building in this city. Uh, and then when I, you know, take a photograph in here of a chair, that that chair is related to this room in this floor in this, you know, and so on. So. You know, it's keeping the data structure. When I make a virtual reality walkthrough, or I take a point cloud scan, or do a you know a 360 panorama VR, all of that media you know gets related back to this and is available for presentation within whatever particular uh, user interface is designed. So, so we don't we you know we're always keeping track of, of what's available, and uh, you know as we add more you know creation tools or link off to you know other existing design tools. You know, we, we keep track of those unique IDs within the within the media, and it's really to me, it, it's just from a you know looking at it from a, you know up in the air, down twenty thousand feet. If you look at almost how much revenue these that two hundred East Randolph generates, you would you would think that the software to do that kind of planning and sales and all that would have been so easy to pay for with all that revenue that is yeah. generated. From just one building, let alone 800 buildings. Yeah, it's just not the case, and I'm sure that David can explain why that is the case. But it astounds me when I look at these facilities and how much cash they do generate. I guess a lot of it's for debt service, though. So. Well, there's a few reasons. Number one, the owners treat these things like bonds. So think about a bond; you'd, it's all about cash flow, right? So any dollar they spend on it is a dollar off the cash flow. Yeah. You got to really, you got to convince them there's a return on it. 
Um, for facilities managers, it's easy because it's already an expense. So they, you, have to, you have to convince them that it could lower their expenses. So it gets easier in that particular world. Yeah. The, the real the real issue is though the brokers, as as cool as this is, the brokers literally see their fees declining because so much of what they do in person through a relationship starts to happen on the web, and they don't like it. So, D David, a, a a a very provocative question, perhaps, it is. Is the business model for new kind of going to competition with JLL and, and CBRE? Ultimately, it, it's in competition with the whole industry that shows property, and, you know, and and puts people into property. It it's gonna let's say it's not competition, but it's gonna change the model significantly. So their current status quo isn't. It just won't survive, and if this if this technology doesn't do it, another one will. It, it's a it's a industry that's ripe for disruption. Yeah, yeah, that's so the way to think What we of. did, what we did as you know, IT professionals inside one of the big companies is we were we try to position it as we're going to give you tools to help you do a better job and promote what we do in a more technological fashion. Like we're more advanced than CD. I think people saw through that somewhat because ultimately in the background we were saying, hey, the real the real thing for us now is we want to capture more of the fee for the house and and understand the broker is going to your average broker is going to see a reduction in fee. The house needs to see more margin. Because that's yeah. the biggest problem in all of those those houses is their more their revenue per person or the, the margin per person is too low because the fees paid to brokers are way too high for what they do. And so it will change the model. It won't necessarily compete. Theoretically, it actually helps the houses, but it will compete with the brokerage model. So we have to be, we have to understand that as we develop it and we have to position it accordingly. And, and, uh, and in all honesty, it needs to be a bit of a Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. It, it it doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm I, I, I'm with you. It just it, it does beg the question, doesn't it? You know, when, when you yeah, because we are disrupting a, a way of thinking. If we can sell, you know, part of it into that existing environment, and as you say, as a Trojan horse, but ultimately, you know, they're going to be the ones that need to change their thinking, or or you know. Just to you know, lose substantial business. Correct. So I mean, you know, at, at some at some point in time, uh, they we all need to be Greeks. <laughs> 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 um, but, but they and I think the houses the houses understand this, right? I know C B understands it through my conversations with Ellie. I know we understood it at the highest level. The issue is you can't alienate the brokers in the short term because they're both public companies and so much of their revenue is built on their existing brokerage model that they can't put that at risk in the short term. Mm -hmm. But that's why this has to happen. I think, in my opinion, that's why this, this is a natural thing to happen, but it has to happen outside the big companies. And then, then they need to subscribe to it as a service bureau, ultimately, when when it's more ready and, and the people are able to cash in on it. The, the yeah. other option is you don't sell it to the big three, but you sell it to everybody else because, you know, look at how disparate the real estate industry is. I mean, the, while the big three control, what, 80% of the Class A CBD market, if you look at what they control of total commercial real estate, it's like less than 5%. So there's yeah. some really interesting things here. In fact, I, I don't know if you remember years ago, UPS had this great commercial about logistics, and they, you know they showed this big behemoth company sitting in a conference room, and they say, "How can that little guy down the street compete with us?" Well, the answer was logistic, right? This is this is uh, real estate's version of logistics, and it, and then it becomes much more of a retail model, 
which has a lot of payers. So there's, you can make it work, I think, monetarily any way you want to go. You just have to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, um, well, look, you know, I, 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 have, I mean, what I'm showing here is, you know, lots of different pieces, I guess, you know, like, you know, like the tools in the box rather than the finished thing here. And, and you know, if anything, it's just to, you, you know, reassure. We, we certainly have all the tools. We can build the cancers. We can build the data models. We can build the visualizations. And you we need more guidance with someone like yourself and the vision of, of what to build oh. to be effective. Otherwise, we're guessing too much. You need storylines and use cases, and, and we've yeah. got those. I yeah. mean, uh, I can bring those mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in, uh, to this group in spades. Fantastic, fantastic. I'll, um, um, so, so going going through, I'll just sort of finish off, I guess, there's just a couple of, show a couple of extra uh, things here. Um, when I said, uh, I'll pop to a different screen, I'll just sort of brought open. This is, uh, you know, uh, just another version of, of the uh, thing where we, you know, we've brought in uh, for bird, uh, for example, Santa Monica, and uh, we've brought in the um, the KML files, you know, for the bus stops, uh, you know, we, we've got clustering and so forth. Um, you've got the, okay, and this is all just using, you know, Cesium uh, as a background, but customizing the, you know, the UI. Uh, you can go to 2D mode, 3D mode, the bus routes, the bike paths. Um, uh, in here, we've got a city of Torrance. Uh, this is where we put up, you know, fiber routes and, and, and labels. And these are the 3D buildings, obviously, from Cyber City, just, you know, integrated, integrated in here. Um, hey, the city of Torrance is going to get excited about this. Oh, we, we've made we, we've got them all sitting on the ground now, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, they've got uh, they got money burning a hole in their pocket, so it'll be a good case study for us. Excellent. Uh, well, we, we we just we solved it. We had we had a niggly problem, David, of uh, just some streams. Still got a couple of things to just check out with Peter, um, but um, I think we've we've knocked that one on the head. Uh, you know, this, uh, David, just so you know, JLL is actually involved pretty heavily with uh, the city of Torrance because they're trying to find new um, users of space for Toyota who moved to Texas. So they're trying to set up new businesses in the economic development division and JLL, they're all working together to do this sort of master plan to get the business park that existed before that's now being vacated by, uh, by Toyota. Right. And they want to know the broadband network and they want to bring in different businesses than just shipping logistics. It's like there's, there's a ton of them in Torrance, uh, shipping log logistics because of the, you know, Long Beach port. They don't want more, they don't want more of that. They want different businesses, right? They want like cyber cities and stuff. So they've asked for a sort of intelligent, data system and intelligent map that allows them to understand the broadband fiber routes and also to bring in other layers of economic information so they can start to plan accordingly. So we did one of the one of the projects we did my team did actually was work with the mayor of Tokyo on 3D visualization and planning for the the, the Olympics when they were bidding for that. Yeah. So, we met with those guys and we, we laid out a whole uh, plan because we had I mean, our, our lead data scientists uh, really ran that with our map it pro project or pro you know, with the product that we had. Yeah. So that was at Esri, Esri at, the, at the technical level, the technology level, but then, then all the data management was done and the data science around location analysis was done by my team at, at JLL and the AT world. That's great. Yeah, so, and that's, you know, that's a broader question we don't have to address here. We've done a pretty good long call, but what about the other industries that we want to deploy the next phase technology to? Hey, how do we to, want to approach that? Sure. Hey, hey, Kevin, I just wanted to make sure I showed David this, you know, because sure. this is key, the, the, the integration that we've done with the, the, the Cyber City model. So it's not just about displaying them, but we've got it so that, you know, each building uh, is linked, you know, to a data model. Yeah. Uh, 
and, and, you know, on, on the fly. So, you know, every single one of these is ready for data entry, you know, and splitting into floors. And we can substitute out. So the moment we select, you know, a building, uh, we can substitute that building out um, for, you know, um, a, a more detailed one, you know, a, a textured one or, a, you know, a, with more detail we can link. So it, it's it's ready, if you like, for, for connection. Um, and you can feed in you can feed in uh, data to this. Like, uh, if I want to know how many people are using Twitter in a building, and I want it to be color represented, you can do that, right? You can you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, assuming that we have access to a data source for that, absolutely. Yeah, it's about identifying. And there are there there is a plethora of them. Uh, so we we would actually bring in social media data to our presentation. So we know how to do that. Yeah, I bet I bet. It's pretty powerful stuff. Um, it also shows the uh, the usage of the building. You know, social media data tells you a lot because people are doing things and they're giving lots of information out, and they sell that. So it lets you understand the capacity of the buildings and what buildings are being the mo used the most, and that's another indicator of you know economics and leasing and all the other things you do. Right. It's a real it's exciting one. Instagram because you're getting. It adds to the visualization because you're getting yeah. pictures of events and other things going on. It's really quite fun. No, so, yeah. So, that. David, what, what I'm just showing here, just to, to support that, this is just a, a you know a, a demo sandbox and the thing, but this is basically a back end administration tool where we can set up you know an entity type which is a building or a sub element of that. You know, so we, we click on a building, it's building. You know, let's look at its data schema. Uh, and you can literally drag and drop to build data schemas for new entity types, and we can add a field on, which is Instagram feed, you know, simply, you know, here, Instagram. So, so you know, the, the um, uh, here we are. And, And you know we can have a stream. It's you know, and this is where we, you go on and you link to uh, the data source and so forth. So that you know, there's a real structure in the background uh, for you know admin and you know user accounts and sort of things. So it's very quick for us to to build up new data models uh, behind uh, the visuals, if that makes sense. It does. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Okay, guys, we've uh, we've we've. We've gotten in deep. Uh, this is a deep dive in product call. <laughs> so um, you want to continue this uh, call? I'm going to have to run in a few minutes, um, but I wanted to, you know, just kind of tie a bow around this and ask. I, I guess uh, David, if you have questions, um, you know, I think the goal here was for Chris just to give you an overview of of what NextSpace is working on right now and uh, the the potential which which uh, which mark has has shown um, but if you have any you know questions ideas or whatever you know fire away well um, I think well, I'm a capabilities guy right so the first thing I'm looking for is what are the capabilities of the technology and the, the data um, part of this bringing together can can the JV can the JV survive or, or thrive um, on the products shown to me from a capability standpoint? So, so I'm seeing all the capabilities uh, on the screen, what I would have been accustomed to from seeing it from my team. And that makes me feel great because we were so far out in front of everybody else. And then it became more of the, okay, we're so far out in front of anyone else it's hard to sell it inside, right? Like, because they, they just didn't understand. The, the, the parts will be, okay, how do we do this? And maybe this is where the JV comes in, but it's, I need to think about it, but how do you do this at a, in a cost-effective manner so that people aren't choking on this when they subscribe to the service or when, when, they, when, they, when they buy the product, right? We have to figure that part of it out. But the capabilities are there to do all the things that I know it needs to do right out of the gate 
and that will sell. And then you then you then you start talking about all right, what is what's the right target marketing? Who do we who do we want to sell it to first? Um, how do we how do we uh, make, you know, start making money build, building this thing? Um, and then because because the add-ons to this are endless, they're endless from a product standpoint, they're endless from a consulting standpoint and a services standpoint. Um, so there's there's a you know you need a roadmap and a plan, and you have to say okay, here's the things that are going to create value faster than others but here's some other things that while they don't create a lot of value complete the product in the minds of somebody who would want to use it right away but we need to look at all of that put that down on paper drive that plan it doesn't take that long to do all of that but um you know the, cap the capabilities are great what i see it's, it's um you know it's exactly what i would be looking for as a platform to build and and some of it's already built and some of it needs filling in and that's that's the value of the new co is to take two great pieces of technology put them together and then build something that's special and, and i'm sure we can do that here yeah i've just by the way Dave, i've just shown you this is um you know mock-up we we you know have a, a suggested you know ui sort of look and feel which is greatly simplified um for a particular use case, so I thought I'd pop that up as an example, just create from birth. We, we have a relationship with a company that, in fact, does the infographics for the US um, elections. Believe it or not, they're actually run out of a little town called Hamilton in New Zealand. <laughs> and uh, the, the firm that does those infographics mm -hmm. uh, is working closely with us, and they found you know, a couple of new sort of UI, standardized UI. So we have we have some good, good um, people involved for that as well, because I think you know what you're saying it is really important that we simplify it down for you know uh, so it's digestible in the first um, uh, you know first round yeah well the next thing you're going to tell me is that there are there russian nationals living in new zealand <laughs> actually i i, I have to confess <laughs> our cto is russian <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> And damn, damn good fellows, I have to say that I, I really enjoy. There's, there's a long history of working with, with we acquired a small Russian company many, many years ago. And this is a long term friendship, but uh, no, I don't think they're interfering with the elections. <laughs> well, neither does Trump apparently, so we're all good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I, I don't, I don't have any. Uh, I've got tons of ideas and stuff that they're not going to come out on the phone, right? Right now, I mean, there's just you know, this stuff so thrills me because I really know this is where this is this is where the the industry needs to go, and you know, every anybody who's in the industry needs to know about space and markets, and and you know, property properties and space within the property and what what the you know, configurable space is, what the lease space is, all of that stuff is tied in here, um, and and that's that's needed by Corporate America, it's needed by real estate professionals. It's 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 needed by anybody who needs space. I mean, there's an endless market for people who want to who really want to understand this stuff because nobody's an act. No one other than the big companies. No one's a real expert on this stuff. And there's so much that's not rocket scientist science stuff that we can bring to them that it creates so much value. And then it allows the big firms to do what they do best, which is really Get in the, the, strategic, the, the strategy game, which is where, where they should play. Hmm. Yeah. No, it's uh, look. It's really exciting to be, you know, uh, working with someone who's got the, you, you know, the vision to take, you know, what we know we can do technically and and, and make it relevant, you know, and useful and valuable. Um, so that it's really exciting. Yeah. And I think you need a few things. You need the you need the experience that David brings. The, yeah. just the whole breadth of he's seen it all, right? Because he's been, been where he's been or he is where he is. And, you, mm. you know, the product side we just talked about, but also you need a little bit of timing. And what I'm finding is the timing seems to be in our favor more so than in the past. With a lot of adoption, I'm seeing a lot of companies now really try to bang on a solution Either they're trying to make Esri solve their problem, or they're trying to make Unity and Mapbox solve their problem, um, and they're just they're just using it for the sake of because they have nothing else. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I see a crying need for a streamlined product, and I guess some of the questions that we'll have to think about answering is, do we make this thing for a fast market entry to just do a couple of things quickly and make it all work? So people can just build their own solution, and that's the that's the killer app that we start with. It's just hey, it's an amazing uh, solution tool that allows you to build your own uh, solution quickly, and we can do it for you. And then we we put a bow around it. Or do you go after uh, the the larger enterprises and try to bring big value and and package consulting around it, and really say, look, this is going to be a much broader service we're going to provide. Um, you know, I'm basing it on who's coming to us now, CyberCity, for buildings, and I'm yeah. getting I'm getting a, a feel, at least from the market, what's happening now and what sort of proposals we're making. And these are not even on the next space uh, platform. These are on some existing legacy systems. So I'm going to try to put some stuff in writing for everyone to give you my take on what I think is happening. But I think what we want to try to do is coalesce around – this business plan and this business strategy, so we can we can really figure out like how much do we need to raise, how big do we need to be, what does the organization need to look like? Like I've got all those questions that we don't even need. I mean, we don't even need to look at the app for that. We need to just talk about it and say, hey, how 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 we want to do this and, and that. I mean, one of my major major questions is, you live up in beautiful Cape Cod, can you get help up there? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, where where it where it where it needs to be. Um, there's there's lots of interesting things there that we can go through in in depth. It, Cape Cod actually happens to be in a spot that there's a lot of technology professionals, so it, it's a possibility. I mean, there's and space is just cheaper than anything here, um, so you know, it's possible. And and you know, we're we're uh, 60 miles away from the city with the most um, colleges and universities in the country, right? So there's a, there's a good market for yep. that. And nobody can afford to live in Boston. So if you, get, if you build something 60 miles away, you still have access. But everybody would love to live on the Cape because it's a beautiful place. So there's also Florida. There's, there's tons of places we could put this, um, all of which mm-hmm. uh, we, you know, we would want to put our own uh, – Location analysis, data science on on top of it, and say what, what would make sense. I wouldn't I wouldn't choose a spot yet. Yeah, that's like an open-ended question, but it's just one of the many questions that uh, that I'm just kind of kicking around in terms of ideas and where we want to go. And yeah. uh, so, so I've, got, I, I've got I've got 1,200 square feet of empty space in the top side of my barn that we could start it in. <laughs> Put it that way. Not space. <laughs> as long as the horses are fine, we're just. It's, it's going to be my office. It's a. It, it's um. It was a barn that was constructed in 2006. It's uh, about 6,000 square feet. Upstairs is 1,200 square feet, 20 feet to the middle, and I'm actually in the process of building it out right now. And it's going to be my office and a, a living room and a, a dining room, which will serve as a dining room and a conference room. We're going to put a big conference table in there um, because we have our, our house is so tiny, but there's so much square footage in this barn. And it's all got radiant heat and amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. Too, that we've, we bought this place for the barn pretty much. So I'm, I'm uh, in the process of doing it now. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, Very good. Okay. Off. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to um, convert it. I don't know. It'll probably convert tonight. So I'll send it off just as a reference uh, video for everybody. And, um, you know, Chris, just think about the next call we want to have and what discussions we want to have. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for your feedback, Dave. Yeah. Thanks for demoing, Mark. And Mark, no, tomorrow, tomorrow, Mark, you and I need to go over a bunch of just active stuff. Uh, I should okay. be a little bit more caught up now. I know you're back. So we'll talk yeah. about that. So I guess we'll all talk again in the next cycle. Okay. It, it, Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank, okay. Thanks, everyone.